Okay, in this video we're going to look at the method of Lagrange multipliers for finding extreme values of a function with more than one variable. So let's say we've got this function f of x1 to xn, so it's got n variables, and we want to find the extreme values, so the absolute max and min of this function subject to some constraint equation. And that constraint equation is given by g of x1 to xn equals k. Okay, great. So the method goes in the following way. We want to find all solutions to the following system of equations. So we have the gradient of f equals lambda times the gradient of g. That's, that's in equations, really, because remember the gradient is going to be a vector which has as many entries as variables um, from the original function. So the original function had n variables, so this is going to be a vector equation with n entry vectors, which means it's n scalar equations. And then we have one more equation given by the constraint equation. So now notice that is exactly n plus 1 variables and n plus 1 unknowns. So our, sorry, n plus 1 variables and n plus 1 equations. So we have n plus 1 equations, and then our unknowns are x1 to xn and this lambda. Okay, great. And then we'll evaluate all of those points, so the x1 to xn points in the original function, and sort them from minimum to maximum, and then we'll have our absolute um, maxes and mins. Okay, so uh, let's look at this example. So we want to find the max and min of this function f of xy equals x squared plus 2y squared on the unit circle. So in other words, x squared plus y squared is 1. So notice this guy right here is playing the role of g of xy in this case. And we also only have two variables, so uh, it, this should be pretty simple. Okay, so we've got two types of equations we need. We need the gradient of f to be equal to lambda times the gradient of g. So let's recall real quick that the gradient of f is going to be uh, the vector made up of partial derivatives of f. And if there are n variables, then it'll be the derivative with respect to the first, second, third, and so on and so forth. So notice that's going to give us the following vector equation. So we'll have 2x comma 4y. So that is the gradient of f for our uh, function. And then that needs to be equal to lambda times 2x times 2y. And that is the gradient of our g function. Okay, great. So now notice we can extract um, entries from these vectors, keeping in mind that we need to scalar multiply by this lambda, and that will give us our system of equations. So notice uh, we'll have 2x needs to be equal to 2 lambda x, so we get that from extracting from the first entry of our vector. We can extract from the second entry of our vector to get 4y equals uh, 2 lambda y, and then finally, we have our constraint equation, which is like given, and that is uh, x squared plus y squared needs to be equal to 1. Okay, good. So now let's see if we can uh, solve this system of equations. Okay, so let's go ahead and start with this one. So we can move some things around and notice we will get uh, 4y minus 2 lambda y equals 0. And now we can factor some things out. Notice that's going to give us uh, 2 times y, and then we'll have 2 minus lambda equals 0. So we've got two cases to work with. Either y is equal to lambda, sorry, y is equal to 0, or lambda is equal to 2. So let's uh, write that down. So case number 1 would be y equals 0. Case number 2 would be lambda equals 2. But now let's go ahead and uh, plug in y equals 0 into this constraint equation down here. And so notice if y equals 0 uh, gets plugged into this constraint equation down here, we get x equals plus or minus 1. So uh, let's see, that will give us uh, the points plus minus 1 comma 0. Okay, great. 
And now the next thing that we want to look at is what happens if lambda equals 2. So if lambda equals 2 gets plugged into this equation, that will give us 2x equals 4x, which tells us that x has to be equal to 0. So that means case 2 will give us x equals 0, which means y has to be plus or minus 1. So we have 0 plus minus 1. So by solving the system of equations, we have found that these four points are the important points uh, for this setup. So, that means we can take our uh, points and our function and then evaluate them. So, let's see. We've got our point 1, 0, minus 1, 0, 0, 1, and 0, minus 1. So, let's plug those into our function. So, 1, 0 into our original function up here will give us 1. Negative 1, 0 will also give us 1. This will give us 2, and this will also give us 2. So, notice we have a minimum at those two points, and we'll have a maximum at the last two points. Okay, I'm going to clean up the board and then we'll do another example. Okay, so for our next example, we want to find the maximum of this function given by f of x1 to xn is the nth root of this product x1 to xn, and it's going to be subject to this constraint that x1 plus x2 all the way up to xn is a constant c. And here, maybe first I want to notice that this is the same thing as x1 times up to xn to the 1 over n power. Okay, great. And then maybe uh, also notice that that is going to give us x1 to the 1 over n all the way up to xn to the 1 over n. So maybe that'll be a helpful way to think of it in a, in a bit. Okay, great. Now, notice uh, for the method of Lagrange multipliers, we need to find the gradient of these two functions. So let's just recall that uh, in this invariable case, the gradient of f will be the partial with respect to x1, the partial with respect to x2, all the way up to the partial with respect to xn. So that will be an n vector. And then we'll have something similar for g, and the role of g is being played by this function right here in this case. Okay, good. So now also let's notice that f is symmetric in all of these variables. In other words, if we rearrange these variables, um, we get the same function. So what that means is if I take the derivative with respect to x1 or the derivative with respect to x2, we should get a similar result that just replaces x1 with x2. So I'm going to go ahead and take the derivative with respect to x1 and then that will allow us to argue what the derivative is with respect to everything else. So notice the derivative with respect to x1 will be the following. We'll have 1 over n times x1 to the 1 over n minus 1 times x2 to the 1 over n all the way up to xn to the 1 over n. Okay, so we've got something like that. Okay, so now the next thing that we want to notice is that we can rewrite this as um, x1 to the 1 over n times up to xn to the 1 over n all over n times x1. Okay, so notice this 1 over n, I just made an n in the denominator, and then instead of having 1 over n minus 1, I just put an x1 to the first power in the denominator. And so um, this is uh, equal to... Okay, so now notice that we can rewrite this numerator as the original function. So I'll just go ahead and write that as f applied to the vector x, where by vector x I mean x1 to xn. And now I have n times x1 in the denominator. And then now similarly, we'll have the same equation for all of these derivatives with respect to xi. This will be equal to the original function divided by n times that variable xi. Okay, good. So now I'm going to clean up this part of the board and then we'll use that to write down a formula for the gradient that's really nice. Okay, so on the previous board, we calculated all of these partial derivatives of our function f. So now I've put them together into this uh, gradient 
uh, vector. So I have uh, function f divided by nx1, function f divided by nx2, all the way up to function f divided by nxn. And then by the method of Lagrange multipliers, we need that to be equal to lambda times the gradient of g. So that needs to be equal to lambda. But notice the gradient of g is super simple. The derivative with respect to x1 is 1, the derivative with respect to x2 is 1, and so on and so forth. So all of these these are just one. So now notice we can take these and create n plus one equations and n plus one unknowns. So our n plus one unknowns are x1 to xn and lambda. So our n plus one equations are going to be given by um, f of x over n x1 equals lambda times one. But then, um, so that's these orange underlines, but then the red underlines will give us f vector over n x2 equals lambda, and so on and so forth. So f x vector over n x n is also equal to lambda. Okay, good. And then, uh, notice all of those are the same. So what that tells us is that we can solve all of these for uh, x n, and notice that uh, this means that x1 equals our function divided by n times lambda, but then x2 also equals our function divided by n times lambda, and xn is also our function divided by n times lambda. So notice every value of x is equal to the same. So notice we have x1 equals x2 all the way that equals xn. Okay, great. But now we can also use our constraint equation, which is x1 up to xn equals c, and that will give us also we have x1 plus up to xn equals c. But now we're adding a bunch of numbers, all of them are the same, and we're getting c. So this is the same thing as n times x1 equals c. In other words, x1 equals c over n. But since x2 is the same as x1 and x3 is the same as x1, that means what we really have is x1 equals x2 equals all the way up to xn. All of these things are c over n. Okay, good. So we found our point at which our maximum will occur. It will occur at the point where all of these values are the same. Now the next thing that we want to do is find the maximum of this actual function. So we can do that by plugging this point into the original function. So I'll clean up the board and then we'll do that. Okay, so on the previous boards we had decided that the max is going to occur at this point x1 to xn where all of those are the same and they're equal to c over n which we get by our constraint function. So now if we go ahead and plug this into the function which is the nth root of this product, so we're going to get the nth root of this product c over n all the way up to c over n. Okay, good. But now notice that's equal to the nth root of c over um, n to the n power. Great. But notice that those are going to exactly cancel each other out and we'll get c over n. But now let's notice that c was equal to, via the constraint equation, x1 plus up to xn. So what we really have is that this is equal to 1 over n times x1 up to xn, where obviously uh, we've taken each of those xi's to be c over n. So anyway, the takeaway here 
is since this is the maximum of this type of function, this is the largest it can be, which means any other value of x that you would plug into this function would give you something smaller than or equal to this. You know, at most equal to it, but actually smaller than it because we calculated that this was the absolute maximum. So that means we can notice that for all x, we have this following inequality, which is given by the nth root of x1 up to xn, which notice that's our function, has to be less than or equal to its maximum value, but recall that its maximum value was 1 over n x1 plus xn. And this might look a little bit familiar. This is the geometric arithmetic mean inequality. Okay, good. That's a good place to end this video.